For all its beauty and splendor, the wilderness can be a cruel teacher. Climbing a mountain is not just an adventure, it's a journey into the very essence of danger, a dance with the forces of nature that remind us of our own vulnerability. It is in the midst of this peril that we find the most profound lessons about ourselves and the world around us. The steep ascents and treacherous descents symbolize the challenges we face in life. Just as each foothold demands unwavering focus and determination, so too do our goals and dreams. The path ahead is fraught with uncertainty and the terrain unforgiving. Yet, it is precisely this perilous nature that makes the ascent so irresistible, for it is only when we confront the abyss that we truly discover the depths of our own courage. In the face of danger, we unearth the wellspring of human resilience, finding strength we never knew we possessed. We learn to trust our instincts, to adapt to the harshest of conditions, and to forge unbreakable bonds with our fellow climbers. The following stories embody the stark reminder that the most rewarding journeys are often the most perilous ones. Please click the subscribe and like buttons. This is the Outdoor Disasters Climbing Disasters Marathon. For one group of climbers, their Mount Rainier climb would be treacherous. On June 19, 2012, five climbers from Waco, Texas, set out to summit Mount Rainier. The climbing party used Rainier as a warm-up for a much harder climb of Denali, the tallest mountain in North America. The group included Stacy Liedel, then a senior at Baylor University, Stuart Smith, an attorney from Waco with a climbing resume that includes some of the world's tallest peaks, including Mount Everest, his niece, Noelle Smith, Ross Van Dyke, Baylor's Assistant Director of Admission Counseling. He had made a previous attempt on Mount Rainier that was called off due to weather. And lastly, Claire McDonald. They decided to do the Emmons Glacier route, a climbing route with no indicators on the trail. On the first night of the two-day climb, they hiked past Camp Sherman and camped on the glacier above it at a place called Sherman Flats. The next morning, the group was up by 1.30 a.m. and began climbing by 2.30. The way up was icy and at an incline of 40 to 50 degrees. I remember sitting in camp the day before our summit push and you can see the summit and just trying to visualize standing on top of the mountain, visualizing the goal. Everything was going really well. It was completely clear. Our team was meshing really well at this point due to illness and just some different stuff going on. There were four of us who were going to make the summit push, she said. Claire McDonald wasn't feeling well and was forced to turn back. Van Dyke and Stuart Smith climbed down with her and when they returned, the group continued towards the summit. The climb progressed smoothly, and Liedel and her companions exhibited excellent teamwork. Eventually, they successfully reached the summit, where they celebrated with Snickers bars and captured the moment with photos. Their enthusiasm centered on returning to camp for a warm bowl of soup and commemorating their achievement. However, they were unaware of an approaching weather front, which had been forecasted for arrival at Mount Rainier either later that night or the following day, but unexpectedly arrived 12 hours ahead of schedule. As they descended from the summit, the temperature took a sharp nosedive. The snow that had been soft and ideal for climbing on the way up had now turned hard and icy due to recent rainfall at higher elevations. During their ascent, the team had successfully crossed a Bergschrund, a sizable crevasse with a narrow snow bridge. However, the shifting weather conditions forced them to seek an alternative route to navigate the Bergschrund. The rapid freezing of everything around them resulted in an abrupt shift to a significantly steeper section of the glacier with an approximately 50 degrees incline and a daunting drop of 3,000 feet or around 900 meters below them. So we had just summited. We were about 1,000 feet below the summit. We were doing a traverse and they don't let you flag on the Emmons Glacier. So we were trying to navigate around a Bergschrund and I was leading the group. As we were going along, it looked as if there was I don't know, a hundred yards left, and then we would have been safe, he said. They had pickets and placed every X number of feet along the route, ensuring safety in case of a fall during their climb. They knew it was a dangerous part of the climb, so taking precautions was essential. Stuart Smith, the person leading the group, completed the traverse. They reached a safer section of the glacier while the rest of the team followed. However, they had run out of pickets with all of them placed in the front and none left for the back. 
Despite this, the group collectively decided not to put another picket and instead relied on careful movement and retrieval of their gear. In reality, I felt really scared because I wasn't on the safe part of the glacier. It was still pretty steep, but you never want to be the weakest link, especially when you're the youngest one, especially being female. You never want to be the one who says, I'm scared or I feel slow or I don't feel capable of this. But I didn't say anything. I just said, yep, that sounds good. Let's pull the picket, Lidl said. Meanwhile, the fifth member of the team, Claire McDonald, was observing their descent from the base camp through binoculars. I got hurt a couple months before the trip and I wasn't able to train like I wanted to. I woke up that morning and was hopeful, but I also didn't sleep very well that night. My stomach was really upset, so I hiked down to the little ranger station there and they had some super high power binoculars they were letting me play with, she said. It is here, through the binoculars, she would witness the upcoming disaster. Stacy, Stuart, Ross, and Noel retrieved the final piece of equipment and commenced their descent. After taking a couple of steps, Stacy attempted to plant her right crampon on the surface, but discovered that it provided insufficient traction. Despite trying to self-arrest with her ice axe, the unyielding icy snow made it impossible to prevent the slide. She instantly realized she had no control over their downward movement. I remember jumping out in a self-arrest pose. I mean, I barely got my axe in before we were ripped from the slope. I felt like I was pulled off of the mountain. When we fell, I thought immediately about my wife. And I said, hey, this is it. This is how I'm gonna die, Ross said. Unbeknownst to them, the Bergschrun they had been trying to traverse was just beneath them, concealed from view. As they tumbled through the air, they realized this was the end, how they would meet their demise. The impact was brutal as Stacy collided with the other side of the crevasse, and everything went dark as her head snapped back. I think I knew right away exactly what was happening and how bad it was because they fell very quickly. When they stopped falling, that was surprising. I didn't understand how they stopped falling, Claire said. Twenty minutes later, Stacy slowly regained consciousness and found herself lying on her back in the snow, gradually reacquainting herself with her surroundings. She was relieved to discover that she was still alive, secured by her harness. Beside her lay Stuart Smith with their bodies entangled in the rope. Peering downward, she spotted one of their companions hanging approximately 60 feet or 18 meters below, also connected by the rope. Nevertheless, the whereabouts of the third team member remained uncertain. Stacy noticed that two ends of the rope led uphill, and without hesitation, she began ascending although she no longer had an ice axe at her disposal. With unwavering determination to avoid another fall, she clawed her way up the slope, using her fingernails to dig into the icy surface. Upon reaching the brink of a narrow crevasse, she saw Noelle Smith, who was dangling inside the crevasse. Noelle had slipped into the crevasse during the fall, but not completely, effectively halting the group's fall and ultimately saving their lives. However, Noelle was in a state of distress uttering incoherent cries, and her harness was gradually slipping down her leg, putting everyone at risk of plummeting into the seemingly bottomless chasm. Stacy knew Noel was the anchor for the rope and the lifeline for the entire team. A sense of urgency came over her. The other climbers were in an extremely vulnerable state with limited responsiveness. Stacy was confronted with the immediate and daunting task of formulating a plan for their escape from this disaster. Meanwhile, Peter Ramos, a climber with a different party, had just summited Mount Rainier. So I had just summited Liberty Ridge on Mount Rainier with a friend of mine and we were exhausted and ready for a break. But I looked over toward the Emmons Glacier and I saw some bodies lying down on their back with a knee up. I thought, oh, that's an interesting way to rest. I kept looking over toward this group and once we moved toward them, we realized it was no longer a rest, he said. Claire McDonald, horrified, looking on from her binoculars down at the ranger station, stated, I said something pretty quickly to the two rangers I was with and gave them the binoculars and they weren't sure, but I just kept telling him, no, they fell, they fell, they fell. They wanted to wait for a while and see if they moved, and nobody moved for a while. That's when they started making radio calls and doing the amazing things they did that day. Upon regaining consciousness, Ross Van Dyke found himself disoriented, struggling to make sense of his surroundings. He detected distant voices, but his senses were akin to those in a movie scene after an explosion. Initial silence followed by a ringing sensation, gradually giving way to clarity. Where am I? 
he pondered. Surveying his surroundings, he saw no one in his vicinity. But then he heard a familiar voice calling his name. Gazing upward, he spotted Stacy. You have to come up here. I can't explain, but you have to come to me, she yelled. Van Dyke drags himself up this mountain with a dislocated pelvis. I didn't know exactly at the time what had happened. I thought that I had broken my femur. There was so much adrenaline going on at that point, I didn't feel any pain. I proceeded to use my one good leg and the crampon that was on that leg and my ice axe in the opposite hand to climb up what may have been 75, maybe 100 feet to where Stacy was. I passed Stuart. I thought he was dead, he said. On the other end, calls from the ranger station were David Bulger, a U.S. Army Reserve Chinook helicopter pilot, when I first got the call, I wasn't aware of how dire the situation was with the climbers or how bad the weather was becoming. By the time I got to the unit and started doing the planning and got the weather, I realized it was going to be the very challenging scenario. Of course I was nervous, David said. For the mission to rescue the climbers on Mount Rainier, the crew comprised two pilots in the front seats, accompanied by a flight engineer responsible for external assessments. Furthermore, there was a crew chief overseeing the winch operation and members from the National Park Service who were integral to the mission. These National Park Service personnel had been picked up at the base of Mount Rainier to aid in the rescue operation. In addition, Madigan Army Hospital sent two paramedics to reinforce their team. Before takeoff, the entire team ensured that they conducted a comprehensive briefing. The two pilots discussed and planned each operation phase considering various potential scenarios. They felt well prepared for the impending task, save for one lingering uncertainty, the precise condition of the climbers they were soon to rescue. The gravity of the situation remained unknown until they reached the rescue site. Meanwhile, Peter Ramos arrived at the location of the fall, a journey that took him and his climbing partner 45 minutes. As a seasoned mountain guide and an expedition nurse, Ramos swiftly sprang into action. Ross, on the other hand, was stunned at what had just happened, with his thoughts echoing, holy shit. At the scene, Ramos and his team encountered a total of four individuals. Noel was trapped within a crevasse, while two others were positioned on a snow bridge just above Noel in the crevasse. Further down the slope, Stuart Smith was lying on his back approximately 25 feet away. I asked for people to raise a hand if they can hear me. Three of them raised their hand except for the person in the crevasse. They actually ended up sustaining a big head injury and they weren't following directions very well. She couldn't state her name. She couldn't state where she was. When I asked if people remember falling off the mountain, she did not. At that moment, I knew that the person in the crevasse was more critical and we had to get her out, Peter said. Until now, Noel served as the anchor, keeping them alive. It's a miracle that she fell into the crevasse, Liedl said. Then, Peter managed to set up an anchor, and around that time, climbing rangers from the base camp where Claire McDonald was watching from had ascended to their location. The physical effort that those two rangers put in getting up there, I don't know how they did what they did. It doesn't. The math doesn't make sense how quickly they were able to get from where I was to where our team was. It was just mind-blowing, Claire said. The rangers went to work deciphering the situation and how to commence with the rescue. They set an anchor. They were able to pull my partners out of the crevasse. They were able to stabilize our whole situation, Stacy said. Once the rangers arrived, Peter turned to them and stated, This is your rescue, and this is your mountain. You tell me where you need me. They requested him to provide medical assistance. Peter proceeded to check on each individual and evaluate their injuries. One of the climbers seated nearby had a broken leg, a broken arm, and a broken back. The person Peter was attending to at that moment had a collapsed lung and two broken legs. The other climber had a dislocated hip and a brain bleed, and he believed she had also suffered a broken back. Upon their arrival at the scene, David Bulger and his team observed the climbers sprawled along the glacier, all in the prone position, clearly showing signs of injuries. The rescuers had triaged the individuals on the ground, establishing the order in which they would be evacuated. The most severely injured were the first priority. During the initial hoist, they lowered it to the rescue personnel and smoothly raised Noel Smith without encountering any problems. After Ramos successfully placed the climber into the sled, 
The Chinook helicopter hoisted her up and momentarily flew away to transport her to safety. Meanwhile, they prepared to assist the next critically injured individual on the slopes, Stuart Smith. The winds at this juncture were strong and a storm had rolled in. Stuart began saying that he felt warm. When someone suffering from hypothermia claims to be warm, it indicates a severe stage of hypothermia and immediate action is required, although it may be late for recovery at that point. The wind was getting worse and we knew that this snow system was getting closer, faster than we initially anticipated. So we knew we were coming under a tight window, but we knew we were just going to continue this operation and get as many people off the mountain as we could, Bulger said. Stacy's most vivid recollection was the intense wind and the powerful rotor wash that felt like it was scorching her skin due to the ice being propelled by it. The helicopter wasn't the usual type, but a Chinook boasting two rotors and witnessing it hover above was an absolutely astonishing sight. I don't know if you guys have ever been around or under a Chinook, but it's a spaceship. It's just unbelievably huge, Ross Van Dyke said. On that day, the crew comprised three pilots, with two in the cockpit and an extra pilot tasked with monitoring the cliff face. The team also included a crew chief responsible for operating the winch and a flight engineer. In addition to the core crew, David's team picked up two paramedics from a nearby army hospital and two more national parks rescue climbers. These rescue climbers were highly regarded within the National Park Service as elite members. They had undergone extensive training in various fields, including alpine mountaineering, aviation, technical rope rescue, avalanche forecasting, backcountry skiing, and emergency medical services. Among these accomplished climbers was Nick Hall. The flight engineer called the hoist distance off the ground and informed the crew that contact was made with the ground, and the rescue climber had unhooked the cable. As the sled was coming down, Peter saw Nick Hall reaching for the sled and giving the okay that the cable was clear to bring in the cable. And the next thing I hear is, oh God, he fell, Bulger said. Peter was anchored into the hillside when he sensed an impact that slightly nudged him down the slope. He briefly depended on his anchor to prevent himself from sliding down the steep, icy terrain. Looking over his shoulder, he witnessed what appeared to be a person hurtling down the slope at high speed. Realizing the gravity of the situation, Peter quickly averted his gaze and couldn't bring himself to watch the remainder of the incident. I quickly looked away as I realized what had just happened and I couldn't quite watch the rest of it, he said. Stacy Liedel recalls, It was just chaos all at once. Everyone's yelling into their radios. You hear lots of things going on. And then it was just silence. At the time, I didn't know what had happened and I definitely didn't realize the gravity of it, but... I remember sensing that something had not gone according to plan. I remember hearing a voice come over to the radio and say, Can someone go down there and check if he's still with us? Bulger nosed the helicopter forward, closely tracking the hall's descent down the mountain. He descended to approximately 8,000 feet, then executed a turn to reverse the helicopter's course, initiating a zigzag pattern as he ascended the gully in search of the climber. Spotting Hall at the base of a cliff, he positioned the helicopter directly above, hovering briefly about a hundred feet above, diligently watching for any signs of movement or response. Recognizing he needed to drop someone down, Bulger had trouble finding a suitable drop-off point in the rugged terrain. He backtracked down the gully by approximately a quarter mile, maintaining the hover. A rescue climber leaped from the helicopter and commenced their journey back to Nick's location. However, fuel levels were running dangerously low at this point. The helicopter returned to its helipad and shortly after, the coordinator relayed the news that the climber who had been dropped off informed him that Nick Hall had passed away at the scene. That was a pretty surreal moment to realize that, that that truly was what just happened, that Nick Hall had fallen. He slipped and fell down 3,000 feet on Mount Rainier. Everyone was at a loss at that moment in time. It was quiet. Luckily, this ranger spoke up and he said the plan now is that those who can go down, go down, Bulger said. Although shocked, everyone remained steadfast in their commitment to the mission and was resolute not to abandon the other individuals on the mountain. They regrouped and pressed on with their mission. There were still three injured people in the party on the mountain with two rangers, as the rest walked down the slope with assistance from the park service. Considering the extended duration of the entire operation, Bulger began to take note of the approaching sunset. He recognized the time constraints and the tight schedule ahead, 
but believed they could still accomplish the task. Ramos had serious doubts about their chances of making it through the storm, given the pure whiteout conditions. However, as they descended, the wind started to calm in time for the sunset, their final light source of the evening and their last opportunity. Ramos and the team then heard the sound of the Chinook again, signaling that it was making one final attempt during this brief window of calm weather to rescue the remaining injured party. The next two climbers went the way that I wish the entire mission did. Just a couple minutes for each climber and no issues whatsoever. It even seemed like the wind died down there for us for just a few minutes. It was perfect, David recalled. Ross Van Dyke, who is in excruciating pain from his injuries, is finally loaded onto the sled. Due to being the least injured, Stacy was slated to be the last person airlifted by the helicopter. The situation was compounded by the onset of a significant storm with powerful winds streaming down from the ridge above, posing a formidable challenge for the helicopter throughout the operation. In attempting to hover over an area with minimal contrast where the view consisted of vast expanses of white ice and snow, David found himself in a challenging situation. High winds only intensified the difficulty, making it akin to trying to balance on the tip of a pen. The pilots had to rotate the task of hovering because it was a physically demanding undertaking. David could attest that, throughout his career leading up to that day and beyond, he had never encountered hovering conditions as arduous as those experienced during that mission on Mount Rainier. They put me on a shelf. Think of it like bunk beds, but they're with litters. And I just remember thinking to myself like, don't hit the mountain, don't hit the mountain, don't hit the mountain. Van Dyke recalls. The cliff face was 20 feet away from the Chinook's rotor system on the right-hand side, and the pilot in the left seat was hovering the helicopter. As the sun dipped below the ridgeline in front of them, the lighting conditions shifted dramatically. David and his team proceeded to lower the penetrator, essentially a seat for rescue purposes. Upon its contact with the ground, the rescue climber swiftly secured the individual in need. David's pilot then faced a critical situation as he yelled, I have lost all outside visual references. I need you to take the controls. This request was prompted by the fact that, with the sun's descent, the surrounding snow transformed into a uniform shade of gray, rendering the terrain indistinguishable. In response, David assumed control of the helicopter, using a single footprint in the snow, visible through his window, as his sole visual reference point. He meticulously maintained a hover holding this position for about 20 seconds, allowing sufficient time for the rescue climber to secure Stacy into the seat. But moments later, the footprint disappeared. The aircraft started moving erratically. The rescue climber on the ground with Stacy Lidl saw the Chinook's erratic movements. He tackles Stacy to the ground and unclips her from the seat. My flight engineer says climbers clear the cable. Let's get out of here. There's nothing else we can do, Bulger recalls. And then the helicopter just took off. It was me and a couple of climbing rangers, and I just remember them being like, cool, so we're here for the night, Lidl said. David and his team experienced a deep sense of concern because they knew the individual they were evacuating was uninjured. However, her harrowing experience on the mountain had left her needing safety and care, prompting their determination to bring her home. Despite their feelings of unease, they recognized that there were no other viable options under the circumstances. Upon landing, David approached the pilot he had been flying with. Drawing from his 10 years of flying experience, he remarked, Hey, in my 10 years, this was the most scared I've ever been. The pilot, with 30 years of flying experience, responded, I've been flying for 30 years, and that was the most scared I've ever been. Lidl found herself enduring extreme cold having been exposed to the elements since 2 a.m. that morning, and now it was 10 p.m. She experienced the most frigid conditions she had ever faced and had gone through a traumatic near-death experience earlier in the day. Throughout the night, she was under the watchful eyes of the two climbing rangers, sharing their collective hope and expectation that the helicopter would return the following morning to rescue them, fostering a sense of eager anticipation. So we wake up the next morning and open the tent door, and it's a complete whiteout. Can't even tell which way is down, and one of them just hands me an ice axe and is like, cool, it's go time. At that point, I realize like, okay, you thought the challenge was over, but it keeps going. You have to continue to rise to this occasion. I didn't know if I was capable of what I had to do, Stacy recalled. On his day off, David spoke with two of the pilots who decided to venture back to the mountain the following day. 
They ascended as far as they could, reaching a point above the cloud layers encompassing Mount Rainier. Their objective was to locate a gap in the clouds that would enable them to descend, but their efforts proved fruitless. Over the subsequent 10 to 12 days, the mountain remained entirely enveloped in dense cloud cover. Stacy and the rangers commenced their descent down the treacherously steep terrain, their visibility severely hindered. As she moved along, the images from the previous day's ordeal continuously replayed in her mind an unrelenting and haunting presence. At one point in the descent, they encountered a significant crevasse that proved insurmountable due to the limited visibility. Frustration set in as they attempted to find a path around it. Stacy's physical, emotional, and mental reserves were depleted, pushing her to the brink of despair. She contemplated the possibility of being unable to take another step. In a moment of profound vulnerability, she made a desperate plea to one ranger, asking him to dig a hole and leave her there as she felt she had reached her limit. It was perhaps the darkest moment she had ever faced or hoped to experience. In response, the ranger offered words of encouragement and challenged her to dig deep, emphasizing that this was the moment that truly mattered. Stacy found the strength to stand up and persevere, and over the course of the day, she managed to successfully descend the mountain to a trailhead. Her Mount Rainier nightmare was finally over. To her surprise, news cameras awaited capturing the incredible ordeal. She was discreetly whisked away to a nearby house, where she was informed that someone wanted to see her. Opening the front door, Stacy was met by her parents, who were overwhelmed with emotion. The reunion was marked by tears and a sense of gratitude. She questioned how she had survived and contemplated how to move forward from the harrowing experience. Earlier that day, Ross Van Dyke was taken to Madigan Army Base, where he learned the extent of his injuries for the first time. He suffered a dislocated hip and a pulmonary embolism. He had a blood clot on his calf, and a piece of that blood clot went through his heart and made it into his lungs. Doctors informed him it may take a year for him to walk again. And I just remember at that moment, I didn't care. I can still see it today, and it makes me emotional every time I talk about it, he said. When an army officer informed him that a rescuer was killed during the rescue, he was extremely saddened by the news. I couldn't believe that what had happened to us caused the death of somebody else, not to mention the fact that it wasn't even our own party. It was an innocent person who was just trying to help us, he said. Despite the injuries of the harrowing ordeal, Stacy, Stuart, Noel, and Ross all made full recoveries. The events on that day on Mount Rainier affected all that were involved. I don't think it fully hit me. I knew in my head, I knew logically what had happened, but I don't think it hit me emotionally for a few days. And I think watching the memorial service and just seeing all of the people that were there and realizing this was a person who led this incredibly rich life. I don't know. He was someone's son. He was someone's brother, Stacy said. I met with Nick's family at his memorial. I learned a lot about him. This guy dedicated his life to helping other people, and as always, my thoughts and prayers go out to Nick's family. They suffered a great loss, and he was a wonderful man, and he'll always be missed, David Bulger said. Ross has made a significant physical recovery, but the enduring challenge lies in carrying the emotional weight of losing a fellow climber. Many friends, and Ross himself, have viewed the events of that day as nothing short of a miracle with the remarkable survival contrasting starkly with the tragic loss of life. This duality is a burden that Ross continues to carry to this day. In an effort to express his deep care and compassion, Ross initially reached out to the Hall family. Despite the tragedy that unfolded, he sought to convey his genuine concern. While he hoped for the possibility of a meaningful connection with the family, Building such a relationship has proven to be a gradual and complex process. The turning point came when Carter Hall, Nick Hall's dad, extended an invitation, asking Ross if he would be interested in bear hunting. This proposition marked a significant moment in Ross's life, as he considered the unexpected opportunity to engage in this new experience. Carter stated, I could see Ross's pain. When Ross came to visit Maine last September, he came to do a bear hunt. So I said, Ross, it's a little difficult getting you successful at bear hunting and you're only going to be here two days. Ross replied, I don't care, Carter. I came to visit you. Stacy grappled with an overwhelming sense of shame, unable to release the idea that her silence and the fact that she was the one who fell were at the heart of the calamity that unfolded. 
Even though there were multiple contributing factors to the accident, she considered her lack of gracefulness as the catalyst for the disastrous chain of events. Dealing with this intense feeling proved to be an immense burden. However, after seeking therapy, Stacy realized that she was not guilty of any wrongdoing. She had not committed any misdeeds, and her slip and imperfection were not something to be ashamed of. Lidl stated, We did not make all of the best decisions that day. We were not perfect people that day and it led to a lot of really horrible things happening. But that doesn't make us any less worthy of love. It doesn't make me any less strong, and the thing that I constantly tell myself is, you're going to be okay, and you will survive this. It was due to the heroism of the Rangers and the Army Chinook helicopter crew, and their grit and determination under the dire and tragic conditions that Stacy made it to base camp and the others to the hospital. She and her fellow climbers are still very grateful to the men who put their lives on the line to ensure their safety. The Rangers were absolute heroes, she said. For Pierre Beguin and Jean-Christophe Lafay, their attempt to summit Annapurna 1 would be a disaster that would live in infamy. Pierre Beguin and Jean-Christophe Lafaye were two of the most skilled mountaineers in the world. They had both summited some of the highest peaks on the planet and were known for their incredible bravery and determination. A climber from the age of seven, Lafaye was initially a sport climbing ace, fully involved in the competition circuit. In the late 1980s and early 1990s, he began to make a name for himself in the climbing community completing several difficult routes in the Alps and beyond. At 41, Pierre Beguin was a household name in France. In international mountaineering circles, he was universally recognized as one of the world's most brilliant Himalayan climbers. In the spring of 1992, French mountaineers Jean-Christophe and Pierre set out to climb Annapurna 1, one of the deadliest peaks in the Himalayas. Lafayette was just 27 years old at the time, but he was already a seasoned climber with several major summits to his name. He wasn't as seasoned in the Himalayas as Begin, but he saw his potential, and with Jean-Christophe's technical brilliance, believed he would be an excellent partner for this ascent. Lafayette was an ace, however, Annapurna would prove to be his greatest challenge yet. The expedition began in early March, when Lafayette, Begin, and their team arrived at the base of the mountain. Annapurna is over 26,000 feet tall, and its slopes are notoriously treacherous. The team spent several weeks acclimatizing to the altitude and preparing for the climb. Pierre and Jean-Christophe hoped to climb a new route on the nearly two-mile-high south face of Annapurna. Finally, on March 22, Lafayette and Begin set out for the summit. They climbed steadily, navigating steep, icy terrain and braving brutal winds. The climb started off well. Began and Lafayette were making good progress up the mountain, and they were able to avoid many of the treacherous crevasses and ice falls that plagued Annapurna. However, as they neared the summit, the weather began to deteriorate rapidly. Winds picked up and the temperature dropped drastically. The climbers were forced to take shelter in a small bivouac tent, huddled together to stay warm. But as the hours passed, the storm grew more intense, and it became clear that they would have to wait it out. Days went by, and still, the storm raged on. The climbers were running low on supplies and the cold was starting to take its toll on them. They huddled together in the tiny tent, trying to stay warm and conserve what little food and water they had left. As the days turned into weeks, it became clear that Began and Lafay were in serious trouble. They were running out of rations and the storm showed no signs of letting up. The two climbers were forced to make a difficult decision they would have to try to make their way back down the mountain despite the dangerous conditions. They started their descent, but the weather was still terrible. The wind was howling, and the snow was coming down in thick, blinding sheets. Began and Lafay struggled to make their way down the mountain, using all of their skill and experience to avoid the dangerous crevasses and icy terrain. This is when disaster struck. As they were descending, the single cam Began was using as an anchor became dislodged. Began falls into the void. Lafay knew immediately he was gone. Suddenly, a sharp sound like a whiplash grazes my ears. The mooring has just come loose. I see Pierre slip and disappear. 
I start screaming with all my being. Pierre, Pierre, Lafaye said. Jean-Christophe looks in horror as his partner plunges down one of the largest mountain faces on earth. It is not possible to live if you fall on this face, he said. Began fell at least 6,000 feet down the face. His body was never recovered. But it is thought to be somewhere amongst the crevasses and deep snow of the glacier at the bottom of Annapurna 1. Lafaye was alone at about 23,000 feet, more than 6,000 feet above advanced base camp. Began had been carrying most of the pair's technical equipment, including all the ropes, and Lafaye was left alone on the face, a vertical mile above safety. Too shaken to move at first, Lafaye eventually began to solo down mixed terrain. He eventually made it to a bivy site set up on the ascent and stayed there all the next day while the storm assaulted the rock face. There was scarcely enough space in which to sit on an ice-covered rock, and he had to wear his helmet all the time because of falling stones. Then when it couldn't have gotten any worse, a falling rock struck his right forearm and broke it in two places. At this point, Jean-Christophe Lafay was in a dire situation. His climbing partner was dead, he had a broken arm, and he had very limited gear and had to descend the most dangerous mountain in the world, or he would perish as well. Jean-Christophe knew what he had to do. He had to make it to their advanced base camp, where more gear would be, and the descent would be much easier for a climber of his skill. So in the face of certain death, Lafayette made the decision to descend or die trying. He decided to start the descent at night in order to expose himself as little as possible to more falling stones. He only had 20 meters of 6 millimeter cord they'd left at the bivy site along with a single sling and two carabiners for gear. He used tent poles for rappel anchors. Using his good hand and his teeth to rig the rappels, he started descending. When it became too difficult to pull the ropes, he abandoned them and continued down climbing. When it looked as if it couldn't get worse, Lafay lost a crampon. Now it looked as if death was a certainty, but he continued to descend. After two grueling and terrifying hours, amazingly, he discovered the missing crampon on a ledge, sitting up on soft snow. He continued descending. By some miracle, Jean-Christophe Lafay reached the advanced base camp. He now had plenty of rope and survival was likely. He found that their tent had been crushed by the recent heavy snowfall, so this wasn't a safe haven. He had to keep moving going down and across the difficult glacial terrain in bad snow conditions. He wearily managed on the afternoon of the 15th to get himself to the base camp of a Slovene expedition. Luckily, a doctor was with the expedition and gave him a shot of morphine and put his arm in a splint. For two days, a helicopter tried to fly him out from the Slovene's camp, but was prevented from doing so by rain falling at lower altitudes. Finally, on the third day, the weather cleared and he was evacuated to a hospital in Kathmandu. Except for his injured arm and fatigue from his ordeal, Lafay was in good health and made a full recovery. The climb of Annapurna was a defining moment in Lafay's career as a mountaineer. The news of the disaster reached worldwide and it cemented his reputation as one of the greatest climbers of his generation and it demonstrated his skill, his determination, and his unwavering commitment to the sport of mountaineering. Despite the tragedy, Began's legacy as a climber lived on. He was remembered as a skilled and passionate mountaineer who had dedicated his life to the pursuit of adventure and exploration. His death was a reminder of the dangers that climbers face in pursuit of their dreams, but it also served as an inspiration to those who continue to push the boundaries of what is possible in the world of mountaineering. Pierre was the best Himalayan climber from France. He was very experienced. We were a good cocktail of his experience and my technique, Lafayette said. After Annapurna, Lafayette resolved never to climb again. But after his long physical and psychological recovery, he began scrambling in the foothills of the Alps and eventually returned to extreme climbing. A year after his accident on Annapurna, he climbed Cho Oyu, and then in 1994, he climbed a new route, solo, on the north face of Shishapangma. It was the first of many solo ascents of 8,000-meter peaks, including consecutive ascents of Gashabram 1 and Gashabram 2 in four days in 1996 and Manaslu in 2001. Annapurna remained an obsession for Lafay. He returned to the mountain three times. The first time he made a solo attempt on the British line on the south face, which failed due to poor snow conditions. 
In 1998, he returned to the same route with a larger team, but the expedition was abandoned when a team member was killed in an avalanche. He finally reached the summit in 2002. Lafayette's last climb was one of his boldest. In December 2005, he began a solo attempt to climb Makalu, the only 8,000-meter peak in Nepal, not to have seen a winter ascent at that time. It was a goal that would have been considered suicidal a few years previously, but for Lafayette, the danger was an important part of the experience. I find it fascinating that our planet still has areas where no modern technology can save you, where you are reduced to your most basic and essential self. This natural space creates demanding situations that can lead to suffering and death, but also generate a wild interior richness. Ultimately, there is no way of reconciling these contradictions. All I can do is try to live within their margins, in the narrow boundary between joy and horror. Everything on this earth is a balancing act, he stated. Over four weeks in December and January, he hauled loads up the mountain, entirely alone above his advanced base camp at 17,000 feet, but was forced to retreat due to weather. However, after two weeks at base camp, the weather improved, and on January 24, 2005, he set off up the mountain. His only means of communication was a satellite phone, which he used to speak to his wife several times a day. By the morning of the 27th, he was camped on a small ledge around 3,000 feet below the summit and told his wife that he would try to reach the top that day. He was never heard from again. Alone on the mountain in winter with no climbers in the world sufficiently acclimatized to reach his high camp, there was no possibility of a rescue attempt. His base camp team gave up hope of him returning alive after he had been missing for a week, and a later helicopter flight over the mountain failed to find any sign of him. His body has not been found, and his exact fate is unknown. For Anna Gutu and Gina Marie Rizzo their Shisha Pangma ascent would be catastrophic. Gutu and Rizzo were striving to make history as the first American women to conquer all 14 peaks on Earth that exceeded 8,000 meters in height. Anna Gutu, a seasoned mountaineer, was a member of the elite Exped team, an accomplished group of climbers who regularly reach summits across the globe. Elite Exped specializes in tailoring guided experiences on some of the world's most challenging mountains. Their mission is clear, to guide and inspire others to follow in their footsteps in the harshest terrains our planet offers. Led by esteemed mountaineers Nims Dai, Mingma David, and Mingma Tenzi, the Elite Exped team holds multiple Guinness World Records for their remarkable Himalayan climbs. They made history as the first team to conquer K2 during the treacherous winter season in January 2021. This exceptional mountain climbing company emerged from their enduring climbing partnership, a bond forged through record-breaking achievements in some of the most unforgiving landscapes on Earth. Founded by these renowned Nepalese mountaineers, Elite Exped boasts a rich climbing heritage that provides them with a distinctive outlook on the mountains. Their approach combines a relentless determination to conquer summits with a deep-seated ancestral respect for these formidable natural wonders. Their mission was to bridge the gap between Western and Himalayan climbing cultures, drawing upon the strengths of both worlds. With vast operational experience across the planet's major mountain ranges, Elite Exped has the ability to assemble seasoned teams wherever adventure calls. Their intimate understanding of the Himalayas gives them a distinct advantage when navigating the world's highest mountain range, ensuring flawless execution even in the challenging death zone of an 8,000-meter peak. While some may prefer to manage operations from the comfort of an office, the founders of Elite Exped lead from the forefront. Nimsdai, Mingma David, and Mingma Tenzi possess an innate passion for mountaineering and guiding, actively participating in many elite expeditions. As stated on their website, at Elite Exped, we know why you climb because we feel the same way. Our shared appreciation of your objectives only makes us more determined to help you achieve your goals. We want to show you how it feels to stand on top of the world and bring you back down safely. Gutu and Rizu Sidlo found themselves engaged in an intense competition, each striving to become the first American woman to conquer the formidable challenge of completing the 14 8000ers. 
Both had already successfully summited 13 out of the 14 towering peaks, leaving only the daunting Shisha Pangma as their ultimate goal. Gutu, despite her lack of prior Himalayan experience, possessed an unwavering determination to achieve the remarkable feat of conquering all 14 peaks in just six months. Shisha Pangma stood as the final pinnacle on her list. In contrast, Rizu Sidlo, hailing from New York City, had already climbed Gashabram 1 and 2, Nanga Parbat, and Manaslu during the summer. She now faced the challenge of conquering the last two peaks, one of them being Shisha Pangma. As fellow American climber Chris Warner pointed out, Rizu Sidlo had initially undertaken a multi-year endeavor to complete the 8,000ers. However, the competitive spirit reached its zenith in the current year as the race for this achievement intensified. Tibet became a battleground of competition, with several climbers, not just the two American women, vying for their place in the annals of mountaineering history. Earlier in the season, Team Elite Exped accomplished a groundbreaking and record-breaking rescue mission on Everest, which took place on May 16, 2023. Nimsdai Nims Purja and his elite exped team executed the world's highest altitude rescue operation from the South Summit, situated in the perilous zone known as the Death Zone, where the atmospheric pressure lacks sufficient oxygen to sustain human life for an extended period. Climbers in this region must rely on supplemental oxygen to survive. On May 16th, after successfully summiting Everest and during their descent, Nims and his elite exped team encountered a climber from another guiding company stranded at the south summit. Perched at an elevation of 8,749 meters, or 28,704 feet, the climber had spent a harrowing night at this perilous height. Acting swiftly and selflessly alongside Anagutu, the team courageously descended with the stranded climber, guiding them safely down to Camp 4, where they entrusted the climber's care to two Sherpas from the other guiding company. Nims expressed his pride and admiration for his elite exped team and clients on the mountain, emphasizing the profound sense of unity within the climbing community. In his words, we are all one community and we look out for each other. Following the successful rescue, the entire elite exped team regrouped at Camp 4 at Everest and began their descent back to Everest Base Camp. Upon returning to Kathmandu, Nims and his elite exped team were joyfully reunited with the rescued climber, Captain Dipendra Singh Khatri, who was undergoing recovery in the hospital. Captain Dipendra had been medically evacuated from the mountain after descending to the lower camps. Gutu had been meticulously documenting her mountaineering achievements on Instagram. In September 2023, she shared her exhilaration at reaching the summit of Dalagiri alongside a captivating video capturing her triumphant moment atop Manaslu's peak. Her June Instagram post celebrated her successful ascent of Mount Kanchenjunga, where she conveyed her proximity to her grand aspiration with the caption, I became another step closer to my big dream, she wrote next to a photo of her atop the summit. In the weeks that followed, the elite exped team achieved the first summits of the season on Manaslu, completing the climb just hours after another team had secured the ropes to Camp 4. Purja was in a rush to travel to Tibet and climb Cho Oyu in pursuit of breaking the record for the fastest ascent of all 14 8,000ers without supplemental oxygen. Elite Exped offered a glimpse of their progress by posting a brief Instagram video confirming that they were installing ropes to the summit, although they had yet to disclose the names of those who had reached the summits or who had utilized supplemental oxygen. Among those who had reached the summits was Anna Gutu, and her quest to conquer all 14 peaks was progressing smoothly. On October 2, 2023, Gutu and the elite exped team triumphantly stood atop Cho Oyu, while Rizusidlo with the Klimbalaya 8K expeditions had scaled the mountain the morning prior. The race for the title of the first American woman to complete all 14 8,000ers was reaching its climax and both women were keenly aware of each other's remarkable achievements. Their drive mirrored that of American climbers Christopher Bernard Warner and Ed Visters, who had previously attained the extraordinary feat of ascending all 14 of the world's highest peaks. 
Although the competition appeared to be friendly, the pursuit of being the first American woman to accomplish this extraordinary feat was fiercely competitive, and it all came down to one final challenge, Shishapangma. Summiting this mountain would come at a steep price. Gina Marie embarked on her Cho Oyo expedition with 8K expeditions Climbalaya, but joined seven summit treks for the ascent of Shishapangma. This 8,000er mountain marked the final summit for Gina Marie Rizusidlo and Anna Gutu. Without delay, both climbers immediately transitioned to their next endeavor, ascending Shishapangma. Days later, Gutu and her team, including members of Elite Exped and Imagine Nepal, initiated their full summit push from base camp on October 7th, 2023. In contrast, Rizusidlo had already reached Camp 2 by this time, according to accounts from climbers at Shishapangma Base Camp. On that fateful morning, Anna Gutu and Gina Marie Rusidlo found themselves camped near the summit of Shishapangma, perched just below the treacherous death zone. They commenced their summit push in the early morning hours, a mere 90 meters or 300 feet from the pinnacle, following the main route to the top. It was at this critical juncture, without any forewarning, that devastating avalanches bore down upon the climbing parties. Tragically, at least seven climbers, including Anna and Gina Marie, found themselves powerless in the face of this impending disaster as the avalanche engulfed them. Swiftly, a rescue party was dispatched in a desperate attempt to reach the trapped climbers. Ming Maji of Imagine Nepal Treks, a guiding company, organized the rescue mission to reach the stranded group. According to the Himalayan Times, rescuers discovered the lifeless bodies of Gutu and Mingmar Sherpa in the snow. Initially reported as missing, sadly, the bodies of Gina Marie and her guide, Tenjin Lama Sherpa from Nepal, were found in the snow. Eyewitnesses recounted that at least two avalanches hit the climbing route when two American women climbers, along with their guides, had ascended above 7,800 meters. Most climbers from Elite Exped and Imagine Nepal decided to turn back at 7,600 meters earlier. While the details remain incomplete, climber Nyla Kiani's tracker ceased registering movement for over an hour before she decided to descend, indicating that climbers may have halted their ascent upon hearing or witnessing avalanches above them. Climber Uta Ibrahini conveyed her feelings throughout the day via text messages over inReach. I had a bad feeling all day. Notably, Tibet lacks helicopter rescue services, necessitating all rescue efforts to be conducted on the ground. Additionally, the avalanches inflicted severe injuries on Nepalese mountain guide, Karma Gelgin Sherpa, who was safely escorted down the mountain by rescuers and is currently in stable condition, as reported. In response to the tragic incident, all mountaineering activities on Shishapangma were suspended. Susan Rizusidlo, Gina Marie's mother, shared that her daughter had dedicated years to training for this endeavor, scaling five peaks just this year and eight others in previous years. The ascent of Mount Shishapangma was poised to become her remarkable 14th achievement. What I heard was, she was the strongest and happiest ever on that mountain, Miss Rizusidlo said. Susan Rizusidlo said she had been told that search and recovery efforts might have to wait until the spring. Gina was just an amazing person. She just lived life to the fullest. She really wanted to accomplish this, Susan said. In an Instagram post on the Elite Expet account, it stated, the tragic events that unfolded on Shishapangma this weekend have devastated the climbing community and our Elite Exped family. On Saturday, an avalanche hit our team as they climbed towards the summit. Tragically, two of our guides and our Anna Gutu were caught in this, along with several other guides from other companies. As the Elite Exped family, we are devastated to confirm that, sadly, Anna and her guide Mingmar Sherpa died. Our guide Karma Gayaljan was also injured. He was rescued and is now in hospital in Kathmandu. Together with the other guiding companies involved, Seven Summit Treks, Imagine Nepal, and Klimbalaya, and members from TMA and CTMA, we are working as one mountain community, together with all the authorities and organizations involved, on the ongoing rescue and recovery mission of our beloved friends and family. We are heartbroken at the loss of Anna and Mingmar, two highly experienced and bright stars of mountaineering. Their legacies are ones of inspiration and achievement, and their loss is felt so very deeply. Mingmar, your smile lit up the room. 
You always brought so much positivity and joy. Your kind, caring nature and warm presence touched so many lives. Anna, our beloved, funny, happy, amazing star, you lifted us all with your great sense of humor and your kind and inspirational heart. Rest in peace, our loved ones. We miss you and are honored we get to say we knew and loved you. We send our love to all the families, friends, and supporters of all those involved in this sad incident. Our thoughts are with you all. For Mary Grimm, her Matt Hood experience would be treacherous. Mary Grimm is an avid hiker and mountain climber and had reached as high as 14,000 feet on the Pacific Crest Trail and taken a number of detours to climb peaks off the route. She felt confident in her skills and ability to assess hazards in the wilderness. When Mary got to Mount Hood area on a Saturday evening in March 2013, she arrived in the Timberline Lodge parking lot tired but ready to conquer the grand peak of Mount Hood. Serious climbers like to begin their ascent in the pre-dawn hours to give them more time before potential bad weather rolls in. But in her case, she decided she needed more rest. She woke up at 2 a.m. that morning, and it was really cold, and she was tired. Mary rolled over and went back to sleep. When she awoke again closer to 10 a.m., she got up and was ready to tackle the climb. Miss Grimm was very under-equipped, and she knew it. She had on hiking shorts over running tights and carrying not nearly enough other layers in her parents' old school backpack. She was starting her ascent hours late and climbing alone. She had told no one of her plans, but Mary Grimm was going to climb the mountain one way or another. She got to the Timberline Lodge and registered. The registration booklet lists things that you should have with you before you attempt to climb, but Mary didn't fill that out honestly. She put she had an emergency beacon and there was somebody informed about her whereabouts, but neither was the truth. The risks Mary was taking were adding up dangerously. She ignored weather warnings and was woefully under-equipped. She hadn't been climbing for the entire winter season and was not in great physical shape, so she wasn't making great progress and ascending slowly. When she stopped to take a breather, a snowboarder is there with her and asks her if she was making a summit attempt. He says, you know, it looks like a whiteout's rolling in. Mary replies, oh, it'll probably clear over. At this time, some climbers are making it down the mountain the snowboarder shouts, what are the conditions like? Terrible, icy and awful, I'm going down, the climber replies. The snowboarder looks at Mary as she just shrugs. The snowboarder jumps back on his board. Okay, well, be safe, he says as he's gliding down the mountain. Mary continues ascending the mountain. It was starting to snow lightly and the temperature was dropping quickly. As Mary continued up the mountain, the wind was picking up. She was wearing only micro spikes on her boots to grip the ice and had an ice ax for stability and she was struggling. It was getting colder, and her hands were not doing well with her gloves already soaked. She was alternating hands. One was used for stability, while the other was in her jacket to keep it warm. Then the whiteout came and Miss Grimm had really low visibility. Then suddenly through the white, she sees a sheer black wall of ice-covered rock. It was insurmountable. It was here Mary finally realized she needed to head back down but getting back down in these conditions will be very difficult given how very under-equipped she was with lackluster gear. She was wet and it was cold. In mountain climbing, the real danger of any summit bid begins on the descent when climbers are tired and cold and the weather is usually getting worse. Mary found herself in conditions so bad that she couldn't tell if she was traveling up or down the mountain and it was getting dark. She had to get off the mountain as fast as possible to speed up the pace, she started doing controlled slides. She would slide using her ice axe as an anchor to be able to stop when needed. And suddenly, it was dark. She pulled out her headlamp and turned it on, and right in front of her was a crevasse that she would have slid into if she didn't stop. Oh, thank you, God, for not letting me die. And I've got to take this a little slower at this point, she said. She continues descending. She was able to get past the cloud that was sitting on the mountain. She saw the lights of Portland, which in some cases would be a welcomed sight, but Grimm realized she was on the west side of the mountain, not the south side where her vehicle was parked. She was now far from where she needed to be. She was trudging through the thigh-deep snow, trying to work over to the edge of the glacier. As Mary pushed on, she stumbled onto the track of a backcountry snowboarder and decides to follow it. But the zigzagging path was hard to follow. She became confused and worried, 
so she abandoned it. Soon, she found herself down climbing boulders and ice blocks over a stream into a snow-filled canyon, then climbing out of it onto a ridgeline where most of the snow had blown and melted off. The trek was grueling, and at this point she was forced to rest. She pulled out a tarp and built a fire using a Nutri-Grain wrapper bars as a starter and slept for about 40 minutes before waking up still disoriented and completely exhausted. She wanted to get moving, so she set off across the snowfield, but the snow was chest deep and she was barely getting anywhere. In the distance, she spotted a tree line on a slope. Believing that the snow would be shallower there, she makes her way to the tree line. From one tree trunk to another tree trunk, Grim was climbing her way up through the icy rock and trees. The slope got steeper as she went up. It got to a point where the trees started to thin out and she was using the ice axe more as a hold, jamming it into the rock and ice and hanging onto it to get to the next tree or next hole. She jammed her ice axe in and had all of her weight on it to push up. She was able to reach the next hold and then the ice axe slipped out. Everything went into slow motion. She tucks her arms in so she doesn't break anything going down and tosses the ice axe to prevent landing on it. Dropping back down through the ice and trees she just climbed, she was pinballing between the tree trunks. Looming at the snow on the field below was a sheer drop down into the river canyon. Grim spreads her arms and legs and punched her hands and feet into the ground. Mary stops. She sat there for a minute saying, well, I'm not dead and that's good. And as far as I know, nothing is broken, can still move all my limbs. As she stood up, she stumbled and realized that there was something wrong with her left leg. She decides to wait until the morning to assess her injury. She was able to make a snow cave for the night and as best as she could, nestles herself in her makeshift shelter. As she zipped up her jacket and put a poncho over her trying to maintain as much body heat as she could, this is when the thought finally came to her. She was likely going to die out there. She pulled out a camera and I made a short goodbye video for friends and family. She was shaking, spasming uncontrollably from the cold. She was dozing in and out, but she realized later that she had to get off the mountain or she'll die right there of hypothermia. She got up and took a look at the wound on her leg. She covered it back over her tights. I'm not going to mess with that because I don't know what to do and it's not bleeding, so that's good, she said. She gets up, takes a step and stumbles again. It took about 20 minutes to get back up because her right foot was sprained. Her left leg has a big gash. Her right foot is sprained. She was in dire straits. She was at the mercy of search and rescue at this point, but she had not told anyone she was going to Mount Hood to climb. She made the decision to stay put. If she drops any lower the canyon, she'll be under the tree line and won't be easily spotted. She got back into her snow cave and spent hours calling out in case there was anybody out there. The weather had improved since Sunday, but there was still a low cover of clouds along with occasional snow flurries. Mary spent her day trying to melt snow in her water bottle by breathing hot air into it, so she'd have a few more drops to drink. At one point it rained, and she used her poncho to collect the water. When dawn came on Tuesday, small avalanches were cascading down the mountains, some pelting her with snow. She decided she had to move to a spot where she'd be less exposed. She started crab crawling across the snowfield to get out from under the canyon wall. She had very low energy and with small rations, so it was a slow, grueling crawl the whole day. On that Wednesday morning, she kept on moving, crawling her way to the ridge line toward where the trees were. About halfway there, she gasses out. I had nothing left. And so again, I carved out a little shelf for myself and had my Keebler crackers and my Nutri-Grain bar and hunkered down, she says. She considered just ending it and being done with it. The next day, the sun came out for the first time. The dirt was warm and she was able to put out a couple of bottles and melt the snow in them and actually take full drinks of water. She started a little fire and warmed up her hands. She didn't dare take her shoes off. She didn't want to see what her feet might look like at that point. And by this time, she was out of rations. She had a little bit of chia seed and decided to just save it until desperately needed. Mary had a reputation as a free spirit. So when no one had seen her for the first few days of spring break, her friends weren't concerned. It was typical Mary. But as the week continued, her roommates began to wonder if something might actually be wrong. So they called Mary's mom and dad. They hadn't heard from her as well. So the parents began to worry. Wondering where she could be, her dad mentioned that Mary mentioned something about climbing Mount Hood. She promised me she wouldn't do it alone, her dad says. The search for Mary was finally underway. 
Authorities had located the vehicle in the parking lot at Timberline Lodge. Friday morning, she woke up and the very first thing that happened was that God spoke to her and said, don't worry about what you'll eat or what you will drink or what you will wear tomorrow. It was like the whole world went right back into 3D full color lights back on in a moment. Like I knew that he was there and that I was gonna be okay. And it was very emotional for me. And the second thing that he told me was that there were thousands of people praying for me. And I got up that morning and I was just like, I'm gonna be okay. God's back and it's gonna be all right, whatever else happens. Friday afternoon, she sees the first search plane. They circled three times around the location where she was. Mary waved her hands and yelled. She was certain that they'd seen her. The plane does the wing dip, signaling they spotted her. She knows they have to send a ground team. They wouldn't arrive that day. I was thinking maybe they don't want to go out in the dark. Maybe they're afraid of losing more people. I was feeling pretty discouraged. And then as I was sitting out there on the ridge line, the stars came out, Grimm stated. On Saturday morning, Mary Grimm packed everything up. They know where I am and I'm gonna, today's the day, she says. The Oregon National Guard helicopter crew was deployed to help in the search effort. As the sun arose coming over the mountain, she finally heard that sound that she'd been waiting for for so long, which was the blades of the helicopter. The helicopter crew spots Mary in a tree well. Mary can see them waving inside the cockpit. She was screaming and waving, please come for me, come for me, don't leave me. They hoisted their medic 150 foot down but landed on the ridge line above her. He yells, are you Mary? Yes, she yells back. He gestured to where the anchor for the helicopter line was and yells, we've got to make it over to there. Can you make it? Yeah, I think so, Mary says. So she started crawling again along the snow to the anchor. They load her onto the rescue seat and hoist her up into the helicopter and off Mount Hood. She was in surprisingly good condition. The medic took a look at her feet. They were swollen and black. She was hospitalized for two weeks after the ordeal. In the months after Mary's rescue, numerous stories were written about what she went through. To her and her family's disappointment, those stories largely ignored the miracle that they believed had taken place, that God had sent an angel to guide the rescuers to her. Mary's dad, Bruce Owen, stated, and that God was acting not only in her preservation, but in the lives of other people who were all connected with that story. People can believe that or not, but it's our story. It's what we experienced, and it's true. For Gillian Webster, her Mount Shasta ascent would be catastrophic. Webster, 32, a mountain guide from California, was raised in a passionately outdoorsy family in Thousand Oaks. She spent her 20s living hand to mouth and working seasonal jobs, ski instructor, mountain guide, to finance her adventures. She had traveled to India and trekked in the Himalayas, traversed the Pacific Crest Trail from Mexico to Canada, and skied daunting peaks in the Alaska backcountry. She was an extreme athlete and would find any excuse to spend the day partaking in outdoor activities she loves. She was working as a guide for Shasta Mountain Guides and was considered to be one of the best guides at the company. She was about to quit guiding and moved in with her boyfriend, renovated their house and took a job as a preschool teacher and seemed ready to try a more traditional life and was planning on finishing the climbing season before settling down. But in 2022, a couple from Seattle who had a taste for adventure but little alpine experience hired Shasta Mountain Guides to aid in their ascent and was assigned Gillian Webster to climb California's most dramatic peak. Shasta isn't the tallest peak in California, but it's by far the most stunning. The tallest mountain in California is Mount Whitney, about 500 miles south. At 14,505 feet or 4,441 meters, Whitney is the nation's tallest mountain outside Alaska and one of the most sought after summits in the country. Impressive as it is on paper, Mount Whitney isn't as dramatic. Surrounded by other similar high peaks in a long, jagged wall of granite at the southern end of the Sierra Nevada range, it's hard to even pick it out. With little foothills and not a similar peak anywhere around, Mount Shasta shoots up from the ground to make for a spectacular view. With being just 15 minutes from a major interstate, Interstate 5, the allure of the mountain is like no other, and scores of people dream of summiting its magnificent peak. On June 5, 2022, 
Jillian Webster and her clients made it to the Bunny Flat Trailhead, checked their gear and covered all the safety precautions. Now they're off, climbing one of California's most sought after summits. Webster and the adventurous couple were making good progress on the ascent but were caught in a snow and rainstorm which forced the climbers to turn around and camp out to ride out the storm. Hours later the trio crawled from their tents partway up the mountain at 2.30 a.m. on June 6 and set out for the summit. The weather was nearly perfect, so clear one of the clients looks up to the sky and was awed by the sight of the Milky Way. After hiking a few hours steadily uphill they stopped to put crampons on their boots near Helen Lake. That's where Webster pulled out the nylon climbing rope and helped her clients attach it to harnesses around their waists. With crampons on their boots and ice axes in hand, they spent hours kicking and clawing their way up the snowy route known as Avalanche Gulch. They did not know that up ahead, an extremely hard, slick layer of ice was waiting for them at the worst possible place, on the steepest section of the climb at about the 12,000 foot or 3,500 meter elevation left over from the storm the day before. When they reached that stretch, one of Webster's co-workers from Shasta Mountain Guides, who was a little farther up the slope, shouted down that it was too dangerous and he was turning his clients around. The other guide looked away. Upon turning back around, he was horrified at what he was witnessing, Jillian Webster and her clients sliding down the mountain. It's unclear who slipped first, but it happened suddenly. They all were yanked off their feet in an instant and hurtled down the slope with terrifying speed. One of the climbers slams his face onto the ice. He tried to self-arrest, a technique he'd practiced days earlier in which a climber digs their ice axe into the snow to act as a break, but that didn't work. It was just an ice field. I had one final glimmer of hope when the axe penetrated the surface, but by then we were moving so fast it ripped out of my hands, he said. The three fell nearly 2,000 vertical feet or 600 meters down the mountainside. That's farther than anybody I can remember my 20 years conducting rescues on the mountain, Nick Meyer of the U.S. Forest Services and lead climbing ranger on Mount Shasta. He blamed the ice. When conditions are like that, the slightest slip can be lethal. As Myers saw the condition of the mountain, he was amazed at how icy the slope was. Even a total pro would have a tough time stopping or self-arresting with conditions like that. The guide who saw the fall radioed the news to a co-worker lower on the mountain and then began a slow, laborious climb down the icy slope to search for the victims. It took him about an hour. He encountered a trail of lost gear along the way, an ice axe, a trekking pole, a crampon, and a single black glove. The co-worker he'd radioed found the victims first, several hundred feet below Helen Lake, with horrendous injuries. Falls are common on Avalanche Gulch, but almost everybody stops on one of several flat spots higher up the mountain or, at worst, when they get to Helen Lake. So when the call first came in and their location was mentioned, we were all scratching our heads like, how did they get all the way down there and why are they so badly hurt, Nick Myers said. Only later did rescuers realize how slick the slope had become. A California Highway Patrol helicopter picked up Myers and a fellow climbing ranger in town and whisked them to within a few hundred feet of where Webster and her clients came to rest. It was a nightmarish scene. The snow was streaked with blood and both clients' bodies and faces were covered with road rash as if they had been in a motorcycle accident on pavement. Each had a broken leg one of the client's ankle was so horribly shattered his foot was pointing the wrong way. Webster, who outwardly looked the best, was in the worst shape. Her helmet was broken, and there was a small abrasion over her left eye. But those were the only visible clues to the horrific head injury she'd suffered. She had been conscious but mumbling and combative when her co-worker found her. Her condition rapidly deteriorated. Then her heart stopped. When she stopped breathing, Webster's colleagues and one of their clients, an operating room nurse and wilderness medicine instructor, took turns performing CPR on her for nearly an hour, to no avail. Jillian Webster would die that day on Mount Shasta. Within hours, that perfect morning turned into one of the most hectic and gut-wrenching days on Mount Shasta in recent memory. Aside from Webster and her two clients, two other climbers plummeted down Avalanche Gulch. All fell more than a thousand feet and all suffered serious injuries. Webster, 32, was pronounced dead shortly after noon. Webster's clients survived the fall but were in bad shape. Rescuers packed both of them into screamer suits and attached them to a long cable dangling beneath a helicopter. 
They were flown a safe distance from the mountainside before being slowly winched up into the helicopter for the rest of the flight to the hospital. Both of the clients suffered broken ankles and required surgery full of plates and bolts, but made full recoveries. While the couple probably won't strap on a pair of crampons or pick up an ice axe again, they don't regret the decision to attempt Mount Shasta. We had the right gear and we had some of the best Mount Shasta guides in the business, he said. Jillian Webster would never get the chance to opt for the traditional life she was looking forward to. Her death shocked the Shasta climbing community, and her co-workers mourned her loss deeply. In a Shasta Mountain Guide's Facebook post, it states Jillian was in her fourth year with us and was a highly experienced, well-respected, and well-loved mountain professional. Amongst the many accomplishments in her life, Jillian was a mountain guide, backpacking guide, and ski patroller, had through-hiked the PCT, recently rafted the Grand Canyon, and was pursuing a career in education. She was one of our best guides, and more importantly, a wonderful person in every way. Our deepest condolences are with her family and loved ones. Our hearts are broken, and she will be very deeply missed by our entire staff. For Joe Simpson and Simon Yates, their ascent of Sula Grand would become one of the most remarkable survival stories in mountaineering history. At the time, Joe Simpson, age 25, stood as a compact, seasoned, and confident climber. He was the youngest of five siblings, born in Malaysia to an Irish mother and a stoic English military father. Simon Yates, on the other hand, was just 21, a fair-haired, wide-eyed Brit who had found his true calling in climbing during his teenage years. He described the mountains as the most beautiful places where you could get away from all the clutter that we have in our world. Beyond being climbing partners, Joe and Simon were close friends who shared an unwavering passion for mountaineering. Their shared love for the sport formed a solid foundation for their partnership. When they embarked on their expedition to conquer Sula Grande in the Peruvian Andes in June 1985, they were well aware that all previous attempts to reach the summit had met with failure. Simpson was determined, saying, my feeling was, well, we'll just do it, we're better. They were driven by the desire to climb uncharted mountains and blaze new trails. Ciula Grande represented the last significant unclimbed face in the Andes, and Yates and Simpson were eager to take on the challenge. During their travels in South America, they met Richard Hawking in Lima, a lone traveler, and invited him to join their climb. Although Hawking had no mountaineering experience, they thought he could be useful at base camp for safeguarding their belongings. The trio journeyed off the beaten path for a couple of days, accompanied by donkeys, until they reached the base of Ciula Grande. As they approached the formidable face of Ciula Grande on the first day, the weather was clear and sunny. The sheer magnitude of the climb ahead left them awestruck. Simpson recalled, I hadn't seen it from this angle and it looked steep. I sort of thought, Christ, that's big looks harder than I thought and than I expected, but I was excited. Amid their excitement, a subtle sense of foreboding lingered as they realized the risks inherent in high altitude mountaineering. Undeterred, Joe and Simon began their ascent of Ciula Grand's west face, adopting the alpine style, carrying minimal supplies with the aim of reaching the summit in a single relentless push. There would be no intermediate camps, no possibility of a helicopter rescue, and no margin for error. Simpson acknowledged the essence of trust in their partnership, saying, if you're going to do that kind of climbing, at some point, you're going to have to rely wholly on your partner. Throughout their ascent, the two climbers alternated as lead and belay, roped together on a 150-foot line. The journey was fraught with hazards right from the beginning, including snowstorms and treacherous terrain. Yet, they persevered, surmounting numerous challenges to reach the summit of Ciula Grande. Their three-day ascent through harsh weather conditions, snow, and plummeting temperatures was, as Simpson described it, the most precarious, unnerving, and dangerous climbing I'd ever done. Upon reaching the summit on a sunny afternoon, they reveled in their achievement, taking in the breathtaking views and the profound sense of accomplishment. They stood about four miles above sea level, their climb representing an incredible feat. However, they were acutely aware that their journey was far from over. 
Simpson remarked, I don't particularly like summits because 80% of the accidents happen on the descent. As Joe Simpson and Simon Yates commenced their descent, massive clouds began to roll in from the east. The climbers had made the decision to descend along the northern ridge aiming for a coal nestled between Ciula Grande and Yerupaya, from where they planned to rappel down a smaller section of the face. They had initially believed they could traverse the northern ridge, but their optimism quickly turned to dismay when they found themselves ensnared in a blinding whiteout. Joe recollects, it was nightmarish. As nightfall descended, the climbers remained perched at an altitude of 20,000 feet. While they prepared to drink some water, they realized that their gas supply had run out. Dawn broke on day four, and they believed that the most arduous part of their journey was behind them. Leading the way, Joe Simpson encountered a formidable obstacle on the ridge, a vertical wall cleaving through its path. His plan was to anchor two ice axes into the top and lower himself down. As he drove his axe into the ice, it produced an unusual sound. Upon withdrawing the axe, he lost his footing and tumbled down a mere 20 feet. However, the impact forced the bones of his lower right leg through his knee joint. Reflecting on the moment, Joe recounts, about a third of the way down the ice cliff, I was thinking, don't fall here because Simon was descending and there was slack rope between us. I placed my right axe into the ice and it disintegrated. I landed at the base of the cliff. My right leg locked backward and my crampons exerted maximum force. It drove my tibia up into my femur and continued through my knee joint. I tore my anterior cruciate ligament, damaged my perineal nerve, obliterated two menisci in my knee and fractured my heel and ankle. The pain was excruciating. Initially in a state of denial, Joe attempted to stand only to feel the disturbing sensation of bones shifting within it. When Simon reached him, he inquired about Joe's condition, to which Joe responded that his leg was broken. In an instant, the dynamics between them shifted dramatically. Previously, equal partners worked together, but now one of them was incapacitated and the gravity of the situation became palpable. Joe remembers, the look that he gave to me sticks in my mind, this look of shock, desperation, and terror. Simon understood the direness of the situation, realizing that this was as dire as it could get. Simon was now faced with the daunting task of rescuing Joe. Together, they devised a plan to create a belay point to alleviate some of the strain on Joe. Simon fashioned a single 300-foot or 90-meter rope by connecting two 150-foot lengths. However, the knot used to join the ropes proved too bulky to pass through the belay plate a crucial piece of climbing safety equipment that controls the rope and acts as a friction brake. Joe, already having lost a significant amount of blood internally, was descending rapidly as Simon lowered him. Every 150 feet or 45 meters, the knot connecting the two ropes would reach Simon's friction device, signaling Joe to relieve his weight from the rope. Simon would unclip, move the knot to the other side of the device, signal with three tugs, and then continue lowering Joe. Joe had to bear the weight on his left leg to create slack in the rope for this process. Simpson, in a state of shock and severe dehydration, slid on his stomach, wincing each time his broken leg jolted into the snow. Yates, determined to get off the mountain as swiftly as possible, had to suppress his instincts in response to Joe's cries. The brutal wind chill factor, registering at negative 80 degrees, compounded their suffering. With no water and the risk of getting trapped in a storm if they sought shelter, they pressed on. Effective communication between Joe and Simon was nearly impossible due to the fierce winds and the distance between them. Simon's efforts to assist Joe were hindered by their inability to coordinate their actions effectively. After several descents, they were nearly down to the glacier when Simon suddenly sensed an increased weight on the rope. He assumed that Joe was navigating steeper terrain but Joe had unexpectedly encountered a patch of ice and slid over a cliff they hadn't anticipated. He found himself suspended over a crevasse, estimating the drop to be around 80 feet, realizing there wasn't enough rope left to reach the bottom. Joe desperately shouted for Yates to halt the descent, but his pleas went unheard. I felt utterly helpless and incredibly angry, Simpson recounted. I clung to the rope and waited for what seemed like an inevitable end. With numb fingers, climbing the rope was impossible for him. I could clearly see that there was a large crevasse directly below me. 
Joe explained. I was attempting to reach for my ice axes to see if I could reach the wall that was nearby. Just as I started doing that, I felt myself being lowered again. I thought, please don't do this, because I knew there wasn't enough rope left for me to reach the bottom. If I couldn't relieve my weight from the rope, Simon couldn't disconnect it to get to the other side, and I was screaming again, pleading not to be lowered. Simon's signal to Joe to take the weight off the rope went unanswered, and a sense of helplessness prevailed. Joe Simpson anticipated Simon's imminent fall past him at any moment. As time wore on and conditions worsened, Simon faced an agonizing decision. He believed that Joe was either deceased or fatally injured, and he confronted the excruciating choice of severing the rope to free himself from the impending danger of being pulled into the crevasse by Joe's weight. Feeling the snow slipping from under him and sensing that he was about to plummet down the mountain, Yates recalled the penknife tucked away in his backpack. I was struggling to maintain my precarious position and the snow was gradually giving way beneath me. I was in a desperate situation, psychologically defeated. I made the decision quickly, he recounted. Simon unzipped his backpack, retrieved the knife, and cut the rope holding his partner. Joe Simpson remembered, Simon hung on for what felt like an eternity, and then I found myself in free fall. Yates's most vivid recollection of that night is the overwhelming thirst he felt and the persistent thoughts swirling in his mind about Simpson's fate. On the following day, he became convinced that Simpson had met his demise, and he saw it as a form of retribution looming over him. As he descended the mountain using abseil, he came upon the cliff and realized that Simpson had been suspended in midair before plunging into a crevasse, which from Yates' perspective seemed immeasurable in depth. He continued his journey toward the base camp, traversing a glacier pockmarked with ominous crevasses, grappling with the daunting task of explaining the situation to Joe's parents, friends, and Richard Hawking. In his mind, he contemplated concocting a narrative that would cast him in a more favorable light. However, upon reaching the base camp, he shared the truth with Hawking. Yates recalls he wasn't in the slightest bit judgmental about me or what I had done. While Hawking thought it wise for them to leave the camp promptly, given Yates' visibly deteriorated condition, Yates needed a day to regain some strength and collect his thoughts. He took the time to freshen up, washing and shaving. Together with Hawking, they symbolically bid farewell to Simpson by burning his clothing. That night, having resolved to depart the following day, they nestled into their sleeping bags. Joe Simpson collided with the crest of the crevasse and plunged through it, crashing into an old collapsed section of its roof before falling approximately 70 feet or 20 meters downward and miraculously survived the fall. Believing Simon had also suffered a similar fall, Joe instinctively tugged on the rope, expecting it to be attached to his partner's body. I could use Simon's body as a counterweight and climb up the rope. Simon had cut it, he recounted. After Simon reluctantly severed the rope, Joe found himself alone at the base of the crevasse, grappling with a severely shattered leg and isolated within the frigid abyss with no means to communicate with Simon or the outside world. The stark reality of his predicament weighed heavily on him and he cried out for his partner, Simon, Simon. Yet there was no response. The crevasse proved to be a frozen, desolate realm that instilled dread in Joe. He could hear the unsettling sounds of cracking ice and the eerie echoes of the wind within the frozen walls. Crevasses have a dreaded feel. They're not a place for the living. I could hear the ice cracking and the wind noise in the ice. I felt very, very alone. And I was very scared, Joe admitted. In the face of freezing temperatures and the constant threat of hypothermia, Joe had only his own body heat to rely on. And he desperately conserved it in every way possible. His initial impulse was to attempt an ascent out of the crevasse. He painstakingly utilized his ice axes and any available handholds to haul himself upward, but progress was slow and agonizing, hindered by his broken leg and the immense physical toll it exacted. Joe's mental state teetered on the edge as he grappled with fear, despair, and moments of doubt. He contemplated his life, his choices, and the looming specter of death within the lonely crevasse. Ultimately, he concluded that Descending further into the dark abyss was his only option. He admitted, I didn't know what I would find down there. I was just hoping there might be some way out of the labyrinth of ice and snow. It was a harrowing decision. 
but Joe understood that he had to take drastic measures or face a slow and agonizing death. So with trepidation, Joe Simpson commenced his descent. He couldn't bring himself to look downward. The darkness was too terrifying. He hadn't tied a knot at the end of the rope, fearing that he might not have the strength to hold himself up if nothing was below. Nevertheless, through sheer luck, he reached the bottom of the crevasse and found himself on a ledge. To add to the miraculous turn of events, light filtered through an opening above, offering a potential escape route. Joe recognized that this was his only chance for salvation. With a severely broken leg and limited mobility, the task ahead seemed nearly impossible. He had to rely on his ice axes and any available handholds to painstakingly pull himself upward. Progress was excruciatingly slow, and each inch gained felt like a monumental victory. Often he slid back down, losing hard-won ground and having to start over. The ascent became a grueling battle against not only his physical limitations, but also the relentless pull of gravity. Throughout this ordeal, the agony from Joe's shattered leg remained a constant companion. Without any pain medication, he endured the excruciating pain as he pressed onward, driven by an unwavering determination to survive. Against all odds, Joe Simpson overcame the crevasse and found himself seated on the glacier at the mountain's base. He recalled, it was a bright sunny day. Wow, the whole world had come back. I lay on the snow, just laughing. That was the relief of escaping that place. Then I looked at the glacier and thought, you haven't even begun yet, mate. Joe was still a considerable distance from the base camp, a mile and a half or 2.5 kilometers of crevasse-filled glacier, followed by six and a half miles or 10.5 kilometers of rocky moraines. In a bid to conserve his dwindling energy and alleviate his pain, Joe carefully scheduled strategic breaks during his ascent. These interludes of rest proved crucial to his ability to press on, yet they also exposed him to the bitter cold and the looming threat of hypothermia. I aim to reach that crevasse in 20 minutes, then that red rock in another 20 minutes, Joe explained. This structured approach instilled discipline and purpose into his ordeal. Sometimes he exceeded his self-imposed targets, experiencing a sense of accomplishment, while other times falling short left him frustrated. Nonetheless, this approach shielded him from contemplating the overwhelming picture of his dire circumstances. As Joe recounted, it kept me from the big picture of you're completely screwed. Simpson recognized the futility of emotion in this situation, understanding that it sapped precious energy. Part of me was pragmatic, thinking how far I could go, what state my body was in, and how little food I had. My conclusion was, you won't make it. But I thought, if you die here, you'll be buried in snow and disappear forever. Nobody will ever know what's happened to you. With this stark realization driving him forward, Joe continued to crawl for the next three and a half days. During the final night of his ordeal, Joe Simpson's physical condition began to deteriorate rapidly. Although he was likely just a 10 minute walk from the base camp, it took him a staggering nine hours to cover that short distance. He drifted in and out of consciousness, succumbing to vivid hallucination. He ceased paying attention to his watch losing all sense of purpose. He was teetering on the brink of death. Realizing the gravity of his situation, Joe resorted to shouting, desperately hoping that Simon and Richard Hawking would hear his calls for help. That fateful night, with the decision to depart the following day already made, Richard and Simon nestled into their sleeping bags. I woke up without knowing why, Hawking recollects and was aware of this strange atmosphere. I could hear the wind howling outside the tent and started hearing something. Simon recalled, it was quite clearly a shout of my name. Simon promptly sprang up and hastened up the nearby stream bed, a distance of 200 to 300 yards where he discovered Joe Simpson. Yates and Hawking were left in a state of profound shock, describing Joe's appearance as ghostly. Joe expressed his gratitude to Simon for his efforts in attempting to bring him down the mountain. Simon recounted, he thanked me for trying to get him down the mountain for all I'd done up to the point where I'd cut the rope and he said, I'd have done the same. Hawking remembers Simpson's asking for his pants, which they had burned, which made Joe very angry. But realizing Joe Simpson was back to his old self, Richard was relieved. Upon his return to base camp on that night in 1985, Joe Simpson had lost a staggering third of his body weight. Yates, who had a background in biochemistry, noticed that Joe's breath carried the scent of acetone, a sign that he was entering a state of ketoacidosis, akin to a diabetic whose condition is spiraling out of control. 
Simpson's experiences over the four days following his fall are nearly unimaginable. After Yates severed the rope, Joe plummeted nearly 150 feet, striking a sloping surface before descending further into the crevasse. Still tethered to the rope, he assumed that Yates had also fallen, awaiting the descent of his partner's lifeless body. Joe began tugging on the rope, and it kept coming. When I saw the frayed end, I realized he'd cut it, Simpson says. It was a strange experience. Everybody thinks you'd see the rope and you'd think, you bastard. But I remember thinking, one, Simon's still alive, and two, he's got my knife. Well done, mate, I thought. We're still in the game. As long as Simon was still alive, I had a fighting chance of getting out. Despite a series of surgeries, Joe returned to climbing in 1987. In 1991, he joined forces with Yates for a Himalayan expedition. However, neither man would revisit Ciula Grande until 2002, when they accompanied director Kevin McDonald and his film crew to produce Touching the Void. The filming took place not only in Peru, but also in the French Alps, with many scenes being composites. This artistic choice was necessitated by the fact that Joe and Simon were the only two to ever reach the Ciula Grande summit, as explained by McDonald. Ciula Grande has been summited a few times since then. The five-week shoot in Peru proved grueling, with cameras freezing in the extreme cold and supplies having to be transported by mules due to the challenging terrain. The crew grappled with the effects of high altitude. For Yates and Simpson, the experience was emotionally wrenching. McDonald observed, When they're in the UK, they're very bluff and unaffected. But in Peru, Simon became very aggressive. Halfway through, he wanted to leave. Simpson, on the other hand, suffered from flashbacks and panic attacks. McDonald noted, when Joe was confronted with the place where he almost died, he became quite emotional. He started crying. The success of Touching the Void left Simon with a sense of dissatisfaction. He believed that the film, which predominantly focused on Joe's struggle for survival, portrayed an incomplete and biased version of events that unfairly depicted him as the man who cut the rope. I raised the fact that just before the credits, a message rolls onto the screen stating that Simon faced strong criticism from the climbing community. That's rubbish. Nobody had any issues with what I'd done in the climbing community at all. They understood. Why then should I have issues? Most people were very supportive and sympathetic, Simon said. The morality of Simon's decision to sever the rope was a topic of debate, but he argues that there was no time for moral contemplation. He explains, I was looking for a solution to the predicament I was in. I took a long time to come up with a solution and by then my own position was desperate. Normally, we would be anchored to the mountains. We put tools into rocks or ice to secure ourselves. But in this case, I was the anchor and I was going to be pulled off. Over time, I got colder as I sat on a snow cliff. The snow was collapsing and sooner or later, I was going to be pulled off the mountain to my death. I got a knife out of my rucksack, which was difficult because I was losing feeling in my hands and cut the rope. It wasn't a great decision. It was a pragmatic act made in the moment. I didn't have the luxury of moralizing you don't when you're making potentially life or death decisions, so I don't see it as an ethical dilemma. Fortunate is a word Simpson uses a lot. Above all, he is fortunate, he says, that what happened on Sula Grande opened up a whole career of writing and public speaking. I would never have discovered I could do this if it hadn't happened to me. I was barely capable of putting pen to paper before. Now I've written eight books. The latest is a novel with that has no climbing in it. Today, Joe Simpson hasn't scaled a mountain in years. The arthritis from his injuries precludes him from even walking far. The great shame is we live in a glorious part of the Peak District and my wife Corinne loves walking, he says. But I can only do about five miles before the pain starts to become intolerable. He pauses and smiles. Actually, it's not much of a price to pay. I should be dead. Mountain climbing teaches us humility. For no matter how skilled or prepared we are, we are always at the mercy of the mountain's whims. It humbles us before the majesty of nature and reminds us of our place in the grand tapestry of existence. It's a reminder that sometimes to conquer the greatest heights we must first conquer ourselves. Climbing a mountain is dangerous, but it is in that danger that we find our greatest growth. It's in the thin air of high altitudes, amidst the chilling winds and unpredictable weather, 
that we discover the indomitable spirit within us. It's where we grasp the fullness of life and realize that to truly live, we must embrace the risks and dare to ascend the peaks of our potential. Remember to stay safe out there. Thanks for watching. This is Outdoor Disasters. Thank you for watching. Want more outdoor disaster content? Check out these stories I believe you'll enjoy.